No, skepticism is awesome. It's, there you like go. A, <laughs> it's a superpower. It's like you can see the matrix code. We have Jonathan, Christian, Tricklin, who actually works with Swoopy on the podcasting track, believe it or not. And uh, he also works for the How Stuff Works people who are actually based here in Atlanta. So if you have quick thing, questions about, you know, how this works, oh, no. just as long as you keep your pants on when you point out what you want to know about, he might answer your question. Uh, <laughs> Not well. All right. Well is the answer. So he's going to tell you about you know, really skeptical stuff as far as like products and technology. So yep. uh, take it away. Let's, see. let's get the mic going first. Oh, okay, so I just need to get it closer. Here. Ah, so that's how a microphone works. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan Strickland. Uh, I have a podcast called Tech Stuff. Has anyone here listened to Tech Stuff? Hey, I've got Tech Stuff fans. Yay. Uh, anyone here been listening for since pretty much the beginning? Okay, so kind of, sort of. Well, you, you'll know if you've been listening from the beginning if you recognize this, which is a listener mail. That, uh, we had so much hate mail that I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Uh, to, and then we did a whole podcast about how having your MP3 player set too high of a volume will damage your hearing and that they should have really taken the blame for that, not me. Uh, so this presentation is really kind of, I'm going to start with a very simple foundation and, and work my way up there. There is a method to my madness. Uh, we'll see how good that method is because this is actually an older version of this presentation. Sadly. My laptop has died, which is why it took so long to get this started. So this is going back to an older version of this presentation. Uh, and I just love the x-ray specs, so that's, that's kind of my, my uh, icon for technology that doesn't really do what it tells you. Uh, by the way, does anyone here know how the x-ray specs work? It's two, well, they, <laughs> yeah, okay. But there are, uh, there are two slats of cardboard put together. And uh, there's a little pinhole right in the middle, and there's a little th thin plastic sandwich there, and in the center of that is a feather. And the feather just sort of uh, interrupts the light as it's coming to your eyes, and when you look at, say, your hand, it looks like there's a little overlay of lines on top of your hand. Thus, you can see the bones in your hand. Um, yeah, it's real high tech. Uh, does not, however, fortunately project ionizing radiation, which would be a downer um, it's also what a real pair of x-ray specs would do. Uh, so we're going to start with the uninformed consumer. So this, this section really is just about how people who are not necessarily technologically savvy might be misinformed in the market for various goods. And I, I picked one that was pretty simple to go with, and a lot of people probably already know this, but we'll, we'll go through it pretty quickly, which is megapixel mania uh, for people who are into digital cameras. Um, now, at this point, this is really a moot point. Megapixels, we, if you're looking at just using a digital camera for personal use and you're going to be uploading images to the web, you don't even need to worry about megapixels anymore because pretty much the, the most basic digital camera on the market, the cheapest one, is going to have a higher megapixel count than you will ever need, assuming you're not going to take a picture of everyone at Dragon Con and then you just want to find you and zoom that into a portrait. <laughs> then you're going to need a high megapixel count. But yeah, for the amateur, amateur photographer, megapixels don't really matter at this point. A few years ago, it might have been a little different, but you, you see people taking pretty good photos with cameras that have really low megapixel counts. It's just not the most important element in a uh, camera, but it is something that's easy to talk about when you go into a store. So you meet a store clerk and the clerk says, oh, well, this camera's got eight mega megapixels and this camera has 12 megapixels and you think 12 is more than eight, that means it's better. And it's not always the case. Uh, so I have here, these are pictures that are taken from CNET. And so these pictures were taken off a website, so we should keep that in mind. These are not the original raw files. Uh, so this is just uh, some 
photos that were shown to, for, uh, for illustration purposes. So you see there's a 7 megapixel picture and a 10 megapixel picture, and they both look equally crappy because uh, I took them off a of web and then I, I expanded them a little bit. But the important thing is just to take a look at what's in this photo. And if you'll notice, there's a tape measure running across the back there. And that's going to be important because we're going to zoom in on it. So you see the 8 megapixel picture, the 10 megapixel, and 15 megapixel picture. Even at this scale where we've zoomed in on that tape measure, uh, there's not a huge amount of difference between the three. Not enough so that the amateur photographer is going to care, but that's not close enough. So here we go to the number 20 on that tape measure with the 8, 10, and 15 megapixels. Here's where you're starting to see the difference, at least between the 8 and the 15. The 10 and 15, it's a little odd. Uh, so yeah, like I was saying, if you wanted to take a picture of the entire population of DragonCon and zoom in on yourself, then you were going to want something that's going to have a higher megapixel count so you can do that without losing resolution. But again, in the market, the, for, the, for the average consumer, uh, let's say, I'll, I'll just say my mom. If my mom went to go and buy a digital camera, she might not know that really the, the, she shouldn't just shop for whatever camera says it has the highest megapixel count that's on the shelf at that store. So what does matter? Well, the type of lens makes a huge difference, although it's kind of hard to find that information out unless you're really digging down deep when you're doing research. Uh, the sensors inside the camera make a huge difference, whether or not you're going to get accurate color representation, uh, whether or not the, the picture's actually going to be sharp. Indoor shots tend to be tricky for a lot of digital cameras. You may have seen some Great digital cameras have these beautiful outdoor shots, gorgeous nature photography, and then you, as soon as you take it into an office building and take a photo of someone, it's all grainy. Um, and what are, what are the other features? Does it have a physical zoom? Is it a digital zoom? Because it does make a difference. Of course, physical zoom is moving the lens so that you're actually zooming in on something. A digital zoom, you're just sort of, it's essentially cropping and you know, you're stretching the photo, just as you would if you were in a, a photo editing uh, program. And read reviews. Uh, I suggest, I, I grabbed this information from CNET. I'm not at all affiliated with CNET, but they do some really good reviews for consumer products. So if you know anyone who's searching around for a various piece of consumer technology and you don't want them to fall victim to some just very basic uh, uh, pitfalls, I would recommend t sending them to a place like that. So that's the foundation, just, you know, just getting yourself informed. So now we're going to move on to one of my favorite sections of all time, vaporware. And actually, I, I've got some notes on this, so I'm going to pull that out because uh, I added to this section, although it's not in the, we won't have the, sadly, we won't have the, the benefit of all the cool pictures I added. So vaporware, uh, this is probably one of the most famous examples of vaporware ever. So yeah, some of you guys know about this, yeah. the Phantom console. Famous. It's no longer vaporware. Well, yeah. it's... Um, we'll get to that. This presentation also is uh, 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 six months old, so uh, seven months old, um, and Duke Nukem Forever came out since then. But no, the, the Phantom Console, here's the, these are three different versions of the Phantom Console. This is what we were kind of uh, promised, and if you don't know, the Phantom Console was this, uh, this product from Infinium Labs which was then called, uh, later called, I think, Phantom Entertainment. Uh, and it was a, uh, supposed to be a console where you could download any PC game and run it on this machine. And you could hook it up to your television and you would uh, purchase games just over the internet. Now, when this was first launching, this was before we had lots of consoles that, where you can actually do this with like the Xbox 360 where you're getting downloadable content. This predated that, so it was a revolutionary idea, and they did show this off at E3, or at least they showed off a box that could connect to the internet uh, at E3. Essentially, it was a computer in a in a case, and um, the we got a lot of uh, uh, investigative journalism involved in this, mostly actually on the ground level. We had skeptics in the community of uh, just the technology community that wanted to really check this place out because it sounded too good to be true. And of course, we know that that means it probably is. So uh, some folks did some digging. They went to the office sites that were listed on the website for Infinium Labs and they found empty offices 
there was no one there. Uh, there was one time where there was a, a building, a floor of a building, and they go to the building, and they went to the floor, and there was, there was literally no tenant in that, on that floor of the building. Uh, they would make calls to the, um, the founder, uh, Tim Roberts. He had a whole list of different companies they supposedly headed at one time or another, and they would make calls to whatever information they could find for each of those companies, and they eventually called someone who they think was Tim's mother, but she did not admit to knowing him. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, so Tim Roberts ended up resigning from Infinium Labs. Uh, he resigned as CEO in 2005 and as chairman in 2007. And the SEC is very interested in Mr. Roberts. And they have actually said that it was a pump and dump scheme, that what Roberts was doing was trying to get as much uh, financial capital as possible with never an intent to actually deliver a product. By the way, uh, they did finally deliver a product, which was a lap board. It was a keyboard for your television if you had internet TV. It's a far cry from what they promised here. And uh, the point here being that just because you hear of something that sounds interesting doesn't mean that there's ever any actual intent to bring it to market. Um, and now we're getting to the vaporware isn't always forever, which is funny because the Duke Nukem forever uh, really was still vaporware when I first did this presentation. And some people say it should have stayed that way based upon how the game turned out. Uh, I never played it, so I, I think I've saved myself some, uh, some pain and suffering. Uh, anyone know what the computer is in the upper right? Oh, yeah, you've heard of Amigas? Oh man, I feel bad now. <laughs> Uh, Amiga is also Commodore Amiga. Yeah, um, that's the that's the Amiga Walker. That was supposed to be a computer that would revolutionize personal computers, but it was almost immediately ridiculed for its design because of that odd shape. But the it was interesting. The design featured stackable components where you would take the top of the computer off, add the the new component, whatever that might be, and then reattach the top of it. So the computer would get taller and taller as you added components. Uh, presumably you would eventually get as many as you possibly could and you wouldn't be able to go any higher or perhaps you would need a ladder. Um, but it never came to market. There were two prototypes made and that was it for that. And then shortly thereafter Amiga went out of business. Uh, the one in the, let's see, that's the lower, well my right, uh, the, the headset, that's the Sega VR. Uh, it was supposed to be a virtual reality system for the Sega Genesis, and uh, it also never went past the prototype stage. People tried it out, and uh, they said it tested poorly, was the way Sega said it. The way the tester said it was, it made me puke my guts out. Uh, apparently, that is not a desirable outcome in the video game world. Uh, it does not sell well. Um, yeah, so that got scrapped as well. That's something we never saw. The white iPhone was what we used to call the tech unicorn because uh, it was always promised, but we never saw it. And then, of course, we finally got that out there. So it's interesting. Uh, when I first did this, uh, I think, I don't even think the white iPhone was out when I first made this, this uh, slide. So now we've got two of those that actually came to market. Um, and by the way, the white iPhone had issues. The reason why, one of the reasons why it took so long to get to market was that because of the white plastic, the sensors in the iPhone weren't tripping properly. Things like the proximity sensor and the light sensor because you were getting light leakage through the case. So it was not reading, like when you had your phone up to your ear, it wouldn't necessarily know that and then you'd start ear dialing people. Um, so that was where, that was one of the things that held that up for so long. And it was also some supply chain issues, things that are not terribly interesting. Um, and now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Technology that has a purpose and it should be used properly but sometimes isn't. So uh, these are two big ones. Uh, we have here an EMF meter and a, a thermal camera, um, or a thermal viewer. Yeah, we're talking about ghost hunting technology here, guys. Uh, so, um, the, one of the most interesting things to me about EMF meters used in ghost hunting technology is that even in the, the, the world of ghost hunting, there's a lot of disagreement over what those are actually used for. You'll get one camp that says an EMF reading is a, a notification that some sort of supernatural entity is at play if you are able to supposedly eliminate all the other possibilities. Other possibilities being things like bad wiring or a magnet. Um, yeah, or, yeah, anything that's going to be generating electromagnetic field could make one of these 
needles move. That's what they're for, really. So if you've got poor wiring in an old house, yeah, it's going to be you know, something creepy is happening. This needle's moving. Yeah, it's because the copper wiring is terrible. Um, so you've got the one camp that says, hey, if that needle moves, if there's an indicator, that means that there's something mystical going on. You have the other camp that says, if the needle moves, that shows that there's electromagnetic frequencies in this area which are causing people to hallucinate and believe that there is something freaky going on. So therefore, there are no ghosts here. So you have one team saying, this proves there are ghosts here, and another team saying, this thing that we don't know actually has any sort of mechanism on the way we think is happening, and that proves there are no ghosts here. And in both cases, it just isn't supported by science. Uh, the thermal cameras also, you see those misused. Uh, people just don't understand that when an area heats up, it can retain heat for a pretty long while. So if you have someone standing, holding a light for a camera in an old house, and then you move to get another shot, and then while you're doing that, you move the thermal camera around, you look, there's this big hot spot over here. Well, it might be because there was a guy with a light standing there for about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so yeah, these are two examples of technology that have either been purposefully misused or just misunderstood by the people who are wielding them. I'm not suggesting that everyone who's using these, uh, these kind of pieces of equipment are doing it knowing that they're, they're creating misinformation. They may very well believe that what they're using it for is, is completely uh, supported by science, but it just isn't so. So moving on with that in mind, we go on to the faulty premises and frauds. This is the fun stuff where we get to talk about actual people who specifically set out to fool us in one way or another using technology. Perpetual motion. So uh, on the left there is the weighted wheel. Uh, it's one of the first uh, examples of a, an attempt to create a perpetual motion machine. Uh, you'll see that there's a little, if you, if you look, you can see there's a little handle there that you're supposed to grab hold of and give it a good turn. And then in theory, those weights were supposed to keep the wheel per, uh, going around and around pretty much forever. But of course it doesn't work. That's not the way uh, the world works. The universe does not work that way. Uh, a guy named um, Leonardo da Vinci looked into this and did some experiments with a weighted wheel. He came to the conclusion that such a thing, such a perpetual motion device is actually impossible. And there it should have died, but it hasn't. And it's stuck around for quite some time. Does anyone recognize what the other one is? The Stjorn uh, perpetual motion device? All right, the original Stjorn per per perpetual motion device used permanent magnets. And it had a wheel with a permanent magnet strip around it, and then a bunch of little permanent magnets around the perimeter. And you would get it spinning, and it would, the magnets would spin and spin and spin, and they would claim that it would last forever unless you asked them about it, and then they said, okay, eventually it stops. Um, the, one, the one that's in the picture there is actually a little different. Instead of permanent magnets, they used electromagnets and claimed that uh, the electromagnets, once it got things started, it would put out more energy that it was taking, and it would actually charge the battery needed to run the electromagnet. Well, once you put a battery in there, you've already really made this much more complex because you have to take down the whole thing, look at how much energy is coming from the battery, actually look and see if the thing is recharging. There was a very uh, public uh, display of this. It was originally supposed to be done, I think, in early 2009 and then got pushed back. But the jury that examined this came to the conclusion that it do just doesn't work. It's, it's bunk. So you still have uh, people trying to pass this sort of stuff off. And I'm kind of sad that I don't have the slide. I guess I can talk about it a little bit, although I don't have the pictures. Um, there's a, a pretty famous problem, well, a famous uh, uh, debate going on right now about a guy named uh, Andrea Rossi. Are you familiar with this, this name? Andrea Rossi claims to have created a, uh, a mechanism that will convert nickel into copper and give quite a bit of energy in the process uh, using something called an E-catalyst, which is sort of the secret ingredient that's added to this mix. It's essentially cold fusion. That's the claim. Uh, he was, he is published <laughs> in the Journal of Nuclear Physics, but before you get excited, that's a blog that he made. <laughs> So it's, it's literally a blog on the internet created by the guy who published, published his own uh, study. Um, 
He got a little bit of publicity because a fellow who used to be uh, head of the Skeptics Society in, uh, in, in Europe, I, I want to say it's Sweden, uh, apparently said that it was a, a fascinating uh, device that actually works, but um, it was not his area of expertise. Uh, he was supposed to do a big demonstration this fall, in fact, uh, I think in October, and I was a little upset that that was going to happen after DragonCon, because then at least we'd have something else we could chat about, you know, the definitive outcome of this test. But uh, what happened was the Greek company that he was working with uh, decided to part ways with him. And so now he is no longer in Greece trying to get this device working. He has moved on to Florida where uh, apparently uh, he thinks he's going to have just as good a shot. So I guess if that doesn't work out, he can go into real estate, which I hear is a great market in Florida as well. Uh, but um bum Yay, power bracelets. Uh, I know. I feel the same thing, people. It, it hurts me to look at it, too. Uh, especially when I think about how it supposedly works. Uh-oh. Hey, whoop. Let's see if we got it now. Uh, well, if mom were wearing if mom were wearing one, it would definitely hurt. Uh, fortunately, my mother is a little more clever than that. I've got it over here, but I don't have it on my screen, which is interesting. Um, anyway, so the power bracelet. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, the claim was that the hologram that's on there is charged to work with the body's energy fields so that you are stronger and have better balance and it makes no sense. Uh, first of all, the, there's no proven el evidence at all that there are any sort of energy fields. Second of all, how do you charge a hologram? I don't, still don't understand that. Uh, and these things were probably cost maybe, I don't know, four or five cents to make and they were selling them for $30 at minimum. Um, but they got into trouble. Uh, the Australian government uh, decided to ask more questions about this and through the process of asking some questions, they uh, they had to back off and say and tell people that there was no scientific basis whatsoever for the power bracelet. So that's a win for us. Yay! Yay. We don't get many of them, so we got to celebrate them when we have them. Yeah. All right. So uh, <laughs> does anyone know what this is? No, it's not a DVD rewinder. <laughs> it's it's all. Winder. This is a uh, this is actually an LPD magnetizer. What? Yeah, it's meant to it's meant to demagnetize your vinyl albums so that you don't have that nasty magnetism. But it also works on CDs, as you can t tell right here. It works on CDs and DVDs up to you know up to five at a time. Much more much more efficient. Um, okay, so we've got the LPs which work based upon, uh, upon kinetic energy. We've got a needle that's actually vibrating and that's what's generating the sound. Um, magnetism has nothing to do with that. Then we've got the CDs or DVDs which are optically based. So uh, of course you're going to need a demagnetizer to make sure that the quality is good. Uh, when, when confronted with the fact that the, these are not magnetic storage media, the company that makes this says, oh, well, it it just it helps all the elements work together so you get the best fidelity possible in your system and uh, and high fidelity by the way talk about woo all right so high fidelity is that's one of those places where uh, one of those fields where you have so many claims coming from so many different people and people will talk to you about how uh, one setup will make a much more warm sound and another one's more flat and these terms really don't mean much They're very subjective and if you were to possibly do a double blind test It might not actually show that uh, that any of the claims have any merit. Well Here we've got these optical discs uh, supposedly the uh, the response was that when people pointed out Hey, you know what a CD is not really made out of uh, actually ferrous magnetic material So what is this doing? They said oh, it's the ink printed on the labels of the CDs and DVDs. Just that ink alone has enough magnetism. It's really, I mean, you're just not going to get Beethoven's symphony played the way you want to hear it. All right, so uh, yeah, seriously, what the hell? All right, so there's the Hawaii chair. Have you guys seen the commercial for the Hawaii chair? It's endlessly entertaining. Um, yeah, that seat rotates. It, it just goes in a little circle and you. It's like you're doing yeah, yeah, like you're doing the hula dance, right? And supposedly that's actually exercising your uh, your abs, which really it's just you know it's just jiggling you around. I mean, 
I got a guy at the office who will do that for you for free. Um, <laughs> his name is Josh Clark. He works in stuff you should know. Uh, just sneaks up behind you. Uh, yeah, there's that. And then the other one is Rejuvenique. The mask Rejuvenique that uses electrodes to zap your face so that your wrinkles go away. Uh, if you ever want to never sleep again, <laughs> go to YouTube and search for Rejuvenique and watch that, that uh, infomercial. And I tell you, it is absolutely terrifying. Uh, you have to put this, um, this gel on the mask before you put it on. And uh, I hear from reading reviews that it does produce some very lovely electric burns on the skin. So if you, if you want people to not notice your wrinkles because your face is horribly burned, get the Rejuvenique. Um, one, of these three, one of these three things on this is tangentially and tenuously supported by science. So we're going to do a little test here. Who here thinks it's the picture that's in the top left corner? Got a couple people here. All right, who th who, I'm not telling you what it is until I'm done. So who here thinks it's the picture in the top right corner? Okay, a few more. Who thinks it's the thing that's on the bottom? Okay, a few more. Um, so I'll tell you, it's the top left. The goofy hat, that's it. That's, that's, that's as close to tenuously based on science as it gets with these things. Uh, that's supposed to be light therapy to help treat things like seasonal affective disorder. There are some studies, mostly out of Columbia University, that suggest that light therapy has some effects, but we don't understand the mechanism behind it. So as far as we know, it could be completely a placebo effect. But we don't, we don't understand the mechanism, but we know that light therapy can, in some cases, help with certain disorders. Not everyone and not all the time, so it's not terribly useful. However, if you want to, you have $200 to burn, you can buy that and look really fashionable uh, and have light shining in your eyes all the time, which is the exact reason why you should have a visor. The, that's what blows my mind. It's a visor that puts light in your eyes. It's like people wearing the baseball cap backwards. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, the, the thing in the upper right corner is an electronic acupuncture device. Yeah. You might think like, hey, that's something to check diabetes or no, 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 electronic acupuncture. And the one below is acupressure. It's supposed to massage the golden triangle, which is a, a, ser a, a place on your wrist where your chi gets all funky and uh, it's supposed to help you go to sleep. That's what that is, is an electric sleep massager. Uh, the acupressure and the sleep massager, those prices, according to every site I went to, are negotiable. But yeah, the visor's gonna set you back 200 bucks. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. All right, so here's a polygraph machine. Uh, polygraph machines are probably, uh, that's definitely an, a, a pseudoscientific uh, subject right there. So the basis of the polygraph is that the assumption is that if you tell a lie, you're going to give off a physiological response. And this device, all it does is detect physiological changes. That's it. That's all it does. So if you know the game going into it, you can fix the game. You can either try and prompt yourself to make a larger physiological response to every question, thus there's no baseline to compare it to, or if you're a really good liar, or, or if you're just really calm, uh, you can try and calm yourself down so that you don't give off a much of a, a reaction at all. Or you can really mess with them, and then all the control questions, you go crazy, and then all the relevant questions, you're like, no, no, that's cool, that's fine. <laughs> like, wow. This guy really hates his mom, but he really didn't kill that lady. Um, polygraph is really all about manipulation and coercion and intimidation. One of the, the ways that they calibrate a polygraph uh, before going into questions, by the way, calibration is totally, that's just bogus. But the, one of the ways they calibrate is often you'll find a, uh, they'll do a card trick. And it is a card trick where you pick a card from a deck and let's say it's the, well, we got Pin and Gillette, Pin Gillette fans in here. We'll say it's the three of clubs. So it's three of clubs and uh, you put the card away. And then what they do is they go through the deck and they'll, 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 or they'll start asking questions like, is it a red card? And you're just supposed to say no to everything. So a red card, no. 
Is it a face card? No. Is it, you know, and you go down and down and down. And then they'll, they'll narrow it down until they finally get to the three of clubs, thus convincing you that the machine is incredibly precise. It's a fixed game. Every single card in the deck is the three of clubs. Or they do a card force, which is not hard to do, and you get the three of clubs. The point being that they already know the answer before they ask you the question. And so the, the, the key is making you believe this machine works. This is not a good tool for getting to the truth. It's a great tool for coercing someone into giving a confession because they're afraid they're going to get caught out. So it's, it's one of the reasons why you don't have polygraph results of, uh, viable in a court of law in most cases, although that can vary depending on where you are. Uh, because it's just not a reliable test. And false positives and false negatives pop up all the time. And it's really just a good way to waste a whole bunch of time if you really want to get into it. All right, so who knows what this is? I'm sure some people know this. Yeah, I heard it already. Yep, it's an e-meter. Have you ever wondered what's inside one? That's what's inside one. The circuit board at the top is for all the digital readouts. You'll notice that that's pretty nice. It's clean. It's, uh, it's well designed. The one on the bottom, which actually has a lot of hand soldering on it and kind of crazy uh, uh, pathways, that circuit is the one that it connects to the cans that you hold. Uh, an e-meter is very similar to a polygraph machine. It detects changes in your physiological responses and uh, what happens is the person who's auditing you will look at anything that registers on the e-meter and then concentrate on that and uh, try to work out your uh, your issues um, it's an it's interesting if you ever get your hands on one of these this I think is a mark 7 uh, they've got more advanced ones now this is this is an older one uh, and now why we should care this is my final my final uh, slide uh, this is a terrible story. That's a bomb detector, or supposedly a bomb detector. What it really is is an antenna attached to a plastic handle, which is attached to a cable, which is attached to a box, which has a RFID card in it, and that's it. There's no power supply. There's no mechanism for detecting a bomb. There's nothing in that device that can even remotely do what supposedly it does. Uh, total fraud. Total fraud. The man who, uh, who made those uh, was um, arrested. He's out on bail right now, I think. Um, if you're wondering how much damage this can do, well, financially, these things sold at $40,000 a piece. A total of $85 million spent by the Iraqi government on those. Hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds of people, up to thousands of people have died from improvised explosive devices because they were putting their trust in a device that literally does nothing. The Iraqi government, by the way, has said that, yes, yes, yeah, most of these are complete frauds, but they're still using some because they say some still work. There's literally no way for this thing to work. There is nothing in it that it's based on dowsing is what it's based on. The fellow who invented it believes in dowsing, but it has no mechanism that can guide it. So this device is at least indirectly killing people. And that's why we should care. And that's really why we should care about critical thinking in general. I mean, it's, it's important for us to really get as realistic a view of the universe as we possibly can, just so that you know, we know what's going on. But lives could be at stake. And that might not be true if you're waiting for Duke Nukem Forever 2 to come out. But it could very well be true if you're a government official and you have a limited budget and you're spending $85 million on a device that doesn't do anything at all. So that actually concludes the presentation uh, that I have. And I am more than happy to answer questions, keeping in mind that if you ask me how something specific works, I may or may not be able to answer. If you want to know about the Large Hadron Collider, that could be fun. <laughs> I do have one question about the what's going to happen with Iraq with this device. And yeah. You think a lot of the reason that they're still saying it works is got some officials who put so much confidence in it, they can't even admit to themselves that they've been duped. I'm sure a lot of it is trying to save as much face as possible because how could you come out and admit that something you've spent so much money on is inadvertently killing people? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of that, a lot of, yeah, some of it is just, some of it's probably self-deception. 
that it's not even that they consciously are saying these things that they they're trying to deceive themselves because who wants to think that the decision they made led to hundreds of deaths not to mention millions of dollars um, some of them probably have a very limited grasp of technology in the first place I mean it's hard to say I've never actually interviewed the Iraqi government uh, haven't had that opportunity we'll see this looks like something I saw on TV a couple of years ago some school system was using this thing and by putting around, they could find drugs in cars, and you could buy a specific one for marijuana, another one for heroin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. same same concept here. It's uh, not necessarily like once you take these things apart, you see that there's nothing in them to do whatever it is. This device here supposedly could detect a bomb up to a kilometer away, or kilometer. I should say kilometer. Fill plates here somewhere, right? A kilometer away, and including underground, supposedly. Um, but again, nothing in there to make it work. I guess going back to a couple portions on the, the uh, polygraph test, didn't they used to do those about the time that started coming out where they tried to prove ESP in plants and everything with uh, the polygraph tests? It's definitely, there's definitely a lot of, well, similar, similar time period, but not necessarily connected as far as the uh, programs go. There's this, uh, you know, once you start learning about electricity and you learn about the wonderful things it can do, you start to think of it like a, a, a miracle uh, phenomenon and I mean we've seen electricity used in everything from uh, uh, therapeutic uses to uh, to claims of things like being able to detect thought and stuff that clearly doesn't think like my uncle I mean it's just so uh, it's not a direct connection but it is similar not a question but yeah. a suggestion yep that you that you comment about the concept of cognitive dissonance as as related to the price of something and the the, the value of it the value yeah uh, yeah okay how can I do this without ticking off the Apple fans um, <laughs> I love my Android phone uh, no, um, th yeah, there's definitely something about that. I mean, we, we live in a, consu a consumerist society, right? We value consumerism. We have television ads and movie placement that constantly reinforce the idea that by buying stuff, we will make our lives better. We'll be better people, we'll be cool, people will like us, we'll be sexy, we're gonna have wonderful lives, we're gonna jet ski, we're gonna jump out of planes, we're gonna have a beer. I mean, all this kind of stuff comes out of just the ads that we see on television. It reinforces this idea that by buying things, you make yourself happy. We even have people who do what they call retail therapy, where they're feeling down, they'll go online, they'll start buying everything on Amazon.com. Um, it definitely exists. And in fact, I would argue that such uh, such a, a, a philosophy, such a concept, it feeds back on itself so much. That, to my, in my mind, may very well have been a contributing factor to the riots that we saw in the UK. We had a whole class of people who have been subjected to advertising that has told them that you need to have these things to have a better life and they don't necessarily have the means to purchase them. And then when the opportunity comes to take them, then why not take them? Because it's going to make their really crappy lives better. And you know that, that's just one tiny element of that that incredibly complex system. I don't mean to suggest that that was what caused everything, but I think it was definitely a factor in it. Um, first, thank you for a very interesting talk. Oh, thank you. Um, but I was just wondering, uh, in your talk, you mentioned two sort of tools to combat uh, this sort of uh, disinformation. The first being. Uh, consumers taking it upon themselves to become informed, mm -hmm. and the second being government regulation, like with the power bracelets or this man being in jail. Sure. Um, what do you think is a better solution in the long term, and what do you think, uh, as skeptics, you should be pushing towards? I think the best solution in the long term is we have to is a lot of individual responsibility, mainly because you can never tell what the people we put in charge are going to do, um, and. You can, never you can never tell when you're going to be outnumbered either. If you, if you are trying to come at the world at a, from a rational perspective and you live in an area where that's just not a, a valued uh, feature, like, uh, like my neighborhood, um, then, then you have to take it upon yourself to do as much as you can to inform yourself and, and encourage it with other people too, but you gotta be really careful about that. Uh, I try and do it just by my writing and my podcasting. I explain like, look, 
uh, I did a I did a full episode about ghost hunting technology, and at the very beginning, I said I want to tell everyone right off the bat I'm a skeptic, because that way, if someone's just offended by the word skeptic, they're going to turn that off, and then I don't have to read all the emails that come in afterward. Um, but I figured that you know you should know this first off, like know that that's my point of view, and if you disagree with it, that's fine. Uh, but you know, just inform yourself before you just have your response. And that goes for agreeing with me, too. I mean, there may be things I've said, I'm sure there are things I've said that people in here disagree with, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I, I don't know everything, and it could very well be that I get things wrong. I do get things wrong. That's what editors are for, by the way. Um, so yeah, even the things I say, I would say, as individuals, it's important to inform ourselves and get the, the best information we possibly can. And I, I think we can't entrust that into any other entity and organization too much. We, we can build them and we can hope that they help take care of things, but we can't just assume that's going to be the be all. Yes. Hi, thanks so much. I um, like your uh, hairstyle. Yeah, well, actually, that's that, just getting to it. But uh, <laughs> two quick questions. Yeah. Uh, first question if you walked into a Brookstone, would you like explode? <laughs> or, or have an Let me tell you, <laughs> there is no publication on, in the world that will make me laugh as hard as Sky Mall Magazine. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I love Sky Mall. It's great. Oh, you're so funny. And second question, since you're a gentleman of my own ill, yes. have you ever looked into the multitude of laser combs and laser oh, wow. helmets that really oh, regrow wow. hair and Wow, that? here's here's some backstory. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when I when I started losing my hair, uh, uh, didn't really lose it. I know exactly where it went. Uh, <laughs> just wasn't on my head anymore um, <laughs> no when I when it started to thin out my uh, I had two people in the space of a week suggest firmly to me that I look into Rogaine and uh, and I think it was those two people one of whom was my mom uh, I love my mother by the way I made I joked about her with the digital camera but she's actually quite tech savvy she's married to a science fiction author so stuff ends up you know she, she knows her stuff as well at least she knows when to tell my dad to stop with his BS. Um, and I love my dad, too. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, so two people told me about the looking into Rogaine. And at that point, I had decided that I don't want to have the people suggest to me for the rest of my life all the products I need to use. So uh, I started shaving my head. But now I get all the people suggesting to me which razor I should use. <laughs> By the way, uh, I tried Headblade, and I love the design, but it is just not practical. Do you know what head blade is? No. It, 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 it fits like a ring over your finger, and you just do this. <laughs> Which is fine until you get to, wait, how do I, how do, I do this? <laughs> I need two razors? No, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Boy, I remember when I used to have skin on the back of my head. That was nice. <laughs> I need help with my girlfriend. Okay, hit me with it, buddy. I love her to death, but she's got anxiety and depression issues, and she's wanting to try Chinese herbal medicine Ooh. and ionic foot baths. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I, well, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> uh, this is really tricky stuff. I mean, when you're talking about something that personal, um, I mean, I would do everything I could to steer her toward I actual... Mean, Clinical she's on approaches, med, but, but she's like, they're not working. And yeah, I'm like, well, I mean, and, and medicine, know, and medicine's tricky, too, just because, you know, yeah. hey, body chemistry like can change very rapidly. Yeah, um, yeah I, would, I would do everything I could to, to, yeah. to I think try and steer her away, but it's, I mean. Be the doctor, or, you know, I know it takes time to build up the meds in your system, but yeah. it's been like a month, and she's like, there's no change. No. Is it? It the, yeah, the, it the, the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then she's got this. Absolute, I can't stand to sit through it at all. But it's a movie called What the Bleep. Uh huh. I haven't seen this. Do I? Do I not want to know more? It's terrible. I'm just gonna let the crowd go. I tried. It, it's the front for a cult. That's all it is. Yeah. I, I sat through it for five minutes. Yeah, uh, like a two-hour movie. Isn't that the one done by the woman who thinks that, like, the spirit of an Atlantean lawyer? Something like that. 
Sounds she's perfectly like, rational to me. I don't know what you're because she's like, it'll change your. I'm like, no. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question for you. Sure. You spoke about Sky Mall. On the flight over here, I was browsing through Sky Mall, yeah. and I came across multiple ads uh -huh. about UV disinfection. As a matter right. of fact, it's the specific one not, that I'm going to ask you about was one where you stuck your shoes, a pair of shoes into this device, and UV light disinfected them. So you would always have a fresh pair of shoes. Well, I mean... And I'd like to know... UV radiation can kill some bacteria. Mm -hmm. So there's some truth to that, but whether or not the items that are being sold in Sky Mall have any <laughs> true efficacy, I can't speak to. I honestly have never tested those uh -huh. at all. Um, and my gut reaction is that I would be a little skeptical of their, their true ability to, to do that. But uh, I mean, it's at least semi-plausible that intense UV radiation could kill off at least some kinds of bacteria, but that's so wishy-washy. But would that be something then that you would want to continue to expose your your shoes to? And oh well, it's to? yeah. Your UV, the UV is not going to make your shoes radioactive, oh. um, which is good because otherwise everything we go outside would be radioactive since uh, we're bathed in UV radiation all the time from the sun. Uh, now it, it's not like your shoes are going to suddenly sprout their own feet and walk around, um, <laughs> unless I don't know. You got really pro big problems with your feet if you do if that does happen. Right, just leaving it outside. Yeah, no, I agree. Or leave it, or leave it in the freezer. I'm serious. Put them in the freezer. And let the freezer and, kill it off. And, and, and really, any bacteria that would be of any, any interest are not going to be thriving in ambient conditions anyway. And you have nice, cool feet. Well, my time is up, uh, but I'll be around if you want to talk to me. Um, and again, my name is Jonathan Strickland. I'm with How Stuff Works. And if you haven't listened to Tech Stuff, you should go and subscribe to that. And listen to a few episodes and find out if you like it or not. Thank you so much.